Okay, so I, I, I was literally asked this question, it's a true question, do gurus have sex? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't come up with that title. Uh, so okay, so... You're going to have lots of hits on another one. I mean, those titles, those titles do tend to, you know, like The Observer or something, or, or, or meaninglessness. But do gurus have sex? Well, re remember, um, so... the. Okay, so the Course in Miracles, put a Course in Miracles spin, we're removing the blocks to love. So we're removing the ego to love. And as you remove, so when I was working in the stock market, the height of my addictions with extreme ego inflation, so then my relationship to the universe is separate. It's based on fear and separation. Yeah. So when I was highly identified with my ego, I felt very identified with my physical body. I felt a lot of uh, negative emotions and I felt a feeling of extreme fear and negative emotions and separation. Uh, I was also an addict as well, meaning that uh, I would come up with projections within my ego of things I could do to get relief from the feelings of fear and separation, temporary feelings of relief. So I had, a, you could say, a separated relationship to the world. And you, would say, you could say a separated relationship to sex, food and work, whereby <clears throat> sex would seem like something that you'd get relief from the feeling of fear and, and separation. So that's how I'd relate. So I did have sex and that was the thing. You'd get relief, it'd be like a highlight of the day or something like that. Um, uh, and it would take me away from feeling this feeling of fear and separation. So that's, what, uh, that's me as an ego-inflated feeling separate from the world and wanting, wanting external things to get some relief from the world. So, do, I mean, a guru, I mean, uh, I don't like the word guru, but, mm. but uh, the, a, a person who's reached, let's say, the enlightened state or the non-dual state, non-dual I prefer, non-dual state, um, <clears throat> so going straight to the other end, so they've let, go of their they've let go of their repressed feelings, they let go of their identification with body and thoughts. So they no longer feel, they no longer experience separation or fear. So they're in states of oneness all the time. So, so then, is there a person there? Is, does the guru exist? Well, a real guru doesn't exist as a person. They're in, in the states of oneness or the non-dual field or in states of... Um, unbroken flow. So then there is no, so it's like St. Francis's prayer is like to be an instrument. To be an instrument of the divine means all experiencing of separation or limitation has dissolved. So that experience of being in separation to the world has dissolved. So a true guru is not a guru because they're, they're, they're one with the ocean. They're one with the sky. So then to the outside perceiver of, uh, of uh, someone in the non-dual state, you know, it could be perceived from their angle that, you know, the guru is having sex with someone, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be like an individual will. That would be the, the flow of the universe orchestrating through that, uh, through, through that vessel. But there's no individual there wanting to have sex with someone. That, that's vanished. It could happen, it could not. I mean, it's like when you're in the flow states, when you're in the non-dual states, what happens is what happens. And how someone in a non-dual state perceives that would be from a... If someone perceives it from a dual state, i.e. from a personhood state, they'll think that the, the teacher is, a, is in separation, but that's not true. The teacher is just unfolding, uh, with the un unfolding of creation. So yes, there could be sex or there could not be sex, but that would be coming from the universe. The thing with... Um, being in the separated states is that things, you know, all enlightened teachers say there's nothing they need or want. Mm. They, they all say, like, you know, if you went up to an enlightened teacher and said, do you want this donut? Would it make you more happy to eat this donut? You know, the, the, it wouldn't make them more happy. They could have the donut or not have the donut. But they're at the highest states. They're in the, the states of oneness. So there is not, no external thing, object or thing, that is going to give them a bigger high. Whereas when you're in the separated states, you know, outcomes and goals and things can make you feel better. Like if I go to another country, I'll feel better. If I have sex, I'll feel better. If I get another job, I'll feel, I'll feel better. 
and you can get you can get both because it makes sense if you understand levels of consciousness because when you are in the ego states you're cut off from the absolute you're cut, cut off from the absolute light the absolute oneness you're you're free of the the thing of separation so when you're in the limited states then these things um, you know like the animal drives can drive you like food work and sex and you're being driven by the ego motives to 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 get these things so the more you're in ego, uh, the more there's repressed feelings and the more limited beliefs, then you're orchestrated from those fields of consciousness. And so those drives, is, as you go down, you could say that the, the drives tend to look more selfish and more self-centered, you see. And uh, as you go up, uh, what unfolds tends to be for, uh, coming out of grace. So they usually, we say God's will is in the interest of the highest good of all concerned, but that can that can manifest through different instruments in, in different ways. So, as you go down, so you have the enlightened teachers, you might have the saints, you know, which will have less and less of the ego motives involved. Then you have the, the normal spiritual seekers who are doing work but still have an identified state. Then you'll have the people who have not done any spiritual work and have inflated ego states. So, the motives, uh, but generally the more you're in the ego, the more the more the capacity to not be in alignment with spiritual principles because um, uh, in those places where you feel cut off you're driven by dishonesty or selfishness to get what you want or what you perceive you need or or the payoffs you know like I might consider stealing a donut when I was in active uh, food addiction but when you are like uh, like when you are spiritually connected you know the idea of stealing is a nonsense because you don't need to steal a donut it doesn't make any sense to do that. Okay. I was going to ask you. Yeah. Where do you put like things like masturbation there, for example? How? What is? Uh, I see it in a, in a, in a more self-centered, ego-centered thing. But how would, in the spiritual view, that categorizes? Uh, how would I see masturbation? Yeah. Well, the way I would see masturbation, this would be an interesting one. I mean, I haven't masturbated for, for a very, very long time. And uh, it's because I try and transcend everything. I try and transcend everything. So it's like, because I come from an, ad an addiction background, I go to 12-step groups, whenever there is an addictive urge to want to get some gratification from the world, I try and transcend that. And that has been my motive now for, I think, like uh, 18 years. So if I, if I want a biscuit, I'll feel the feelings, go to the observer, sit with it until... Um, so if you look, look at Hawkins' work, you know, these things, these desires for things are finite. So you can feel out everything until they dis dissipate. And then if you do that, or do the spiritual work, eventually they have no hold on you. So to stay like in the eternal now, the witnesser right now, it's like, like a donut or the need to masturbate won't have a uh, have a, a needy pull, mm -hmm. you know, it won't have that. So you can dissolve that energy. So the way I would look at it, and I haven't done for a very long time, I have no urge to masturbate, is if there was, I would have, um, and there hasn't been, I think, for many years, then you'd be able to sit with that feeling until it passes. And then when I don't, I would say, like, if you don't need to do it, then you could do it. But then actually, when you don't need to do it, often you don't need to do it which is a kind of a paradox. Like if I wanted to buy something, I would just sit with the urge, I need to buy something, and sort of say like, well, and then, you know, I could, I could buy it tomorrow, but I won't buy it today, I would sit with it until the urge is gone. And a lot of the things that I thought I needed to buy, if, if you filled them all out, you don't need to buy them anymore. It's like, it was an illusion that I needed to buy, buy something, or I needed to masturbate, or I needed to do something. So then it's like, so it's like when you become in an alignment and you take out the urge, then it's up to the universe, you see. If that happens, it happens. But there's no... Once you feel out the impulse and you feel out all the repressed need to do it, you know, or by going to the observer, then actually whether these things happen or not is irrelevant. Also, once you start to, you know, like masturbate, it, you know, you'd see, like, are there images coming up? Is there a need coming... Feeling out the need? Is there a belief? That I uh, you know, do I if I thought I believed I needed to masturbate because it's healthy I could cancel that belief because mm -hmm. I believe that's a that's a limiting idea everything that's limiting I can cancel it's not that I 
I'm against the universe orchestrating, but anything from the ego, like a like a, an urge, or a belief that I should, I could I could take those out. Also, um, to let go of any sort of ego identification, you know, going to the observer or cancelling that, or making a thing meaningless. So, you know, like like masturbation would be as meaningful as buying some new tissue paper. You see, there shouldn't be anything. So when you're in the when you're in the eternal flow, like. One activity is not no more special than another activity. Like, should I water the plants or should I masturbate? Isn't then they're not they're not sort of. You see, when you're in the observer, they make no difference. You see, it's not like one's gonna. So so sometimes you might end up well, I water the plants rather than masturbate because it's like that's what orchestrates out of it. But that's the way I I do it because for me it's like to transcend anything within myself that feels that is it's, it's coming from a limited perspective. And then when it's, when it's non-dual and it flows out of the universe, well, that's the universe's thing. You know, it's got nothing to do with the personal will feeling it needs to. So that's how, you, how it go up through the level. But it's a great question. It's a great question. Because I treat masturbation the same as donuts. You know? You know, I don't want to be driven, because that was my major addiction to food. I don't want it to be a driver or something that will take me out of a a witnessing or a, a limitless phase. Because r- remember, when you're in those limit, limitless phases, when you're in the flow states, it's only anything that the ego would identify with that will take you out of those states. You know, I remember there was one guy who was in a flow state and he got a letter, an envelope through the door. And that, that because it was an identified thing, if the ego tracks something as special or important or have significance, and the ego gets involved, that then takes you out of those flow states. But if the ego didn't, you know, like if an envelope was the same as a potted plant, then that had no meaning, symbolic meaning to the ego, then the flow states or the limitless states prevail. It's only so, one of the things when you're in those flow states, because once you're in those states, you don't want anything to take you out. You don't need the ego to track or to pick up something uh, as being significant, and then those flow states. So you're letting the universe then don't pick anything up. But going back to that, considering I was the one with the letter. Yes. Um, there's a difference between a plant and a letter from an organisation telling you owe them a lot of money. You know, it's, it's a bit of a different reaction, and we are living. So to actually move away from the impact of suddenly something that's a threat to your environment and your well-being, because that's how I perceived it is different to just noticing as a, pl- a plant or a tree as you walk down the street. And, when, and, and so to compare that, say, and I'm not, I'm not deliberately trying to be challenging, I'm trying to be understanding here. So to compare that to fixing behaviour, as in donuts, masturbation, whatever, it's not quite the same. Oh, no, it's I agree. The, the I totally, totally agree. It's, the, it's not an attraction. It's more of an aversion. But, um, okay, so... If the source is the real source of being in the flow is the real source of your security, yeah. then um, then it is rendering. One of the tools is like to be in, if if in the flow state everything is taken care of by grace, then it would be then the things that the ego recognizes as threat to financial survival or, or physical survival. To keep those to keep the the states of grace going, it would be then to render. You see, when, when something is rendered meaningless, it doesn't mean you're more like, it's more like from those states of grace, there's a more of a neutrality in dealing with those things. When those things have a, a fear-based charge, then you're taken into a state of fear. So it's not that, you know, in those flow states, one can't pick up the bill and take action, but, but it's more from a place of neutrality than from a place of fear. Yeah? Uh, it's okay that we're on camera, is that right? Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Um, one thing comes to mind while I'm listening to the two of you, and uh, wouldn't, if the fear came up, or whatever, you know, the negative feeling that came up, to stay in the flow, wouldn't it be advisable to just sit with the fear then? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You just let the fear, so, you know, and just let the fear sort of just sit with it. I mean, just, just fear. Well, going back with that, I don't want to give the whole detail while the camera's running, but I'm quite happy for the camera to be running. 
But what it wasn't so much. Well, the you off if you no, no, carry on because it's all relevant to anybody who yeah. might find it useful listening. Mm -hmm. It's um, it wasn't the actual receipt of the letter. Yes. That was the actual problem. What was happening was the result of the response to this and how I had to behave and ha and and then there was and then I had a seven month wait after that to decide whether anything was going to be any further action was going to be taken. And it was in the seven months of anxiety. Um, I mean, bear, bear in mind, this was back in about 2011, 2012, so it's quite a long time ago now. But it was that seven months of anxiety where I found it increasingly difficult to maintain that flow state that I had been in for some time. I mean, I'd been, I, was, I was just buzzing on life <laughs> up until that point. Now, in hindsight, looking back, I believe that the positive response, the fact that nothing, no action ever, ever was taken, nothing else happened, and that's kind of disappeared, was as a result of me being in that flow state when I had it. Mm. But maintaining the flow state through that period of anxiety and not knowing was incredibly difficult. I mean, I didn't manage to do it. I, I, I lost a lot of my... Um, I've got to... I, it's always tricky with the words we use, but my enlightened state of being, my my... Um, oh, what's the word? Peace of mind. Yeah, well, yeah, but I mean, it's um, the um, it was it's been used in here. We're expensive. This my, yes. my that I lost I lost that higher perspective, and ever and and it. I mean, with with me personally, and this may just be my own thing. If there's anything that's going to spit me out of the zone faster than anything, it's usually money. Because there is so much of my survival, my, my balance that's tied up to that. Now I know that's an attachment I've got, and I have to a lot of the time I have to ignore it and just work on everything else because it's got such a powerful hold. But that does seem to be the anxiety around that for the next seven months. It was I didn't quite go into hardcore addictive fixing behaviour as a result, but that's where things were leaning. It felt like. So this is where the donuts could have raised their heads, so to speak. This is where the donuts were sitting at the end of my bed every morning going, we're talon, canita, citas, and we're all vegetable and sugar, you know? That's, that, so maintain, yeah, so I think really it was the, it wasn't the letter itself, it was the, it was the ongoing process that lasted a long time. Yes, and I think, I mean, I was just speaking from it, no, I totally relate, I was just speaking from a certain angle, like if you're yeah. in the flow state, uh, whatever you pick up will be the thing that will drag you down first, then other things will, will drag you down. But, but also in my experience, and I think my, nearly every spiritual seeker, you know, you can be in flow states and then you get hit by stuff and you have to process that out, mm -hmm. you know, through feeling the feelings or through going to the observer or doing the course mm -hmm. until those identifications get, get released. So there can be two, two angles. And as someone was saying here, you know, like um, on the spiritual path, um, I like what Hawkins uh, says, says on it, um, which is that you do spiritual work and you go into these sublime states and then you're ready to bring up the next tranche mm. of karma, mm. uh, which then comes up for, for you then to resolve the next bit to go on to the next level. Yeah, yeah I, I recall on many, many occasions when students would, would tell Dr. Hawkins and say, you know, uh, I'm like, like it's been mentioned here today, you know, I'm in the flow and I'm not, and I'm not feeling it anymore. And you know, a lot of people have, have come with that to, to Dr. Hawkins, and he always says what you're saying. It's mm. it's not all supposed to be fabulous all the time and, and feeling great all the time. But part of the work is for the for the stuff to come up, and when you're ready for the next batch, yes. <laughs> it gives you a little bit of grace yes. That's right. <laughs> and you flow a little bit so that you can see this is how it's going. This is where you're going. Mm. One day it'll always be. It'll be like this always. Yeah. And that kind of that's what keeps you on the path is knowing that there there is that, and then when you're ready, the next lot comes. That's you right. I mean, that. But a lot of the time I find myself going, no, I didn't say I was ready. What you makes <laughs> 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 you think I'm ready? <laughs> 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 you're wrong. I think, I think it's about. I'll yeah. stop. <laughs>